This one might make your knees weak. Hi, I'm Jessica the Museum Guide, and today I'm here at the recently reopened Hunterian Museum, chronicling the life of Dr. John Hunter and the history of surgery. It's not for the faint of heart, but I think it's stunningly beautiful and incredibly interesting. Are you ready to be shocked, intrigued, appalled, and of course fascinated? Then you're in the right place, because today we're exploring the Hunterian Museum. Closed for a massive overhaul for more than five years, the Hunterian is back open and welcoming guests into its grisly collection. This is often cited as the most disturbing museum in London, for good reason. It's home to thousands of specimens of humans and animals, some of them really quite strange. Now, the history of surgery is well represented in London's museums. The old operating theatre features on my list of the strangest museums in London, and I'm planning on an even longer video about the history of surgery. But no conversation about medical museums in London is complete without the Hunterian. The museum is named for Dr. John Hunter, who we'll meet and explore at length on this tour. The museum reopened on the 16th of May 2023, following a five-year, £4.6 million redevelopment of the headquarters of the Royal College of Surgeons at Lincoln Inns Field in Hoburn, central London. The collection includes more than 2,000 objects from Dr. Hunter's original personal collection, as well as thousands of instruments, equipment, models, paintings, and archival material, including England's largest public display of human anatomy. If you're planning a trip to Glasgow anytime soon, and you should, you can visit the Hunterian's other location at the University of Glasgow, where Scottish Hunter studied. As we walk through the museum today, I will pause and talk about some of the most interesting and bizarre objects in this true medical cabinet of curiosities. As always, we could spend weeks in this museum, but I'm just going to highlight some of the strange, grisly, and interesting specimens that caught my eye as I wandered through. This video isn't for the faint of heart, so get ready to explore the 10 rooms that take us through the history of surgery from ancient Egypt to the present day. As always, I really love it when my viewers support my channel, and you can do that as simple as leaving a comment, liking, and of course subscribing, or you can always buy me a coffee or leave me a tip on PayPal. The information is below. Let's start here in room one, at this show-stopping display case that greets you as you enter the museum. Here we can see specimens and objects from different eras. A medical wax created by renowned sculptor Joseph Town, who we'll talk about later. A German anatomical model used for teaching. A set of lungs injected with wax to show off the pulmonary system. A dazzling display case of glass eyeballs. A trepanned skull, that is, a skull that has undergone trepanation. The practice of cutting a hole in the skull bones for spiritual purposes or to relieve pressure and a set of eyeglasses with a prosthetic nose, perfect for hiding your severe case of syphilis, more on that condition later, and Hunter's experiments. The Hunterian is also home to many non-human specimens, including these skeletons of solitaire birds, a now extinct species of flightless bird related to the dodo. There's also a rather gnarly example of a bone infection on this wild boar, and this massive elephant brain preserved as a wet specimen. Behind these fascinating objects is a portrait of the man himself, Dr. John Hunter. As you can see, throughout the museum, there are many new interactive displays and modern museum curation methods. These really help bring the museum into the 21st century and engage visitors of all ages. I cannot stress enough what a wonderful job they've done here with the reopening of the Hunterian Museum. This is really beautiful curation and it's really easy to explore the life of John Hunter and the history of surgery with what they've done. The Edwin Smith Surgical Papyrus is a really remarkable exhibit for all of those fans of ancient Egyptian archaeology. This is the oldest surviving medical text in the world, detailing the treatment of 48 different diseases and maladies dating to about 1600 BCE. 
It was first translated in 1930 by James Henry Breasted, an American archaeologist, Egyptologist, and historian. In that same case, here's some medical instruments dating from the Roman Empire. And it really makes me cross my legs. It's a bronze vaginal speculum dating from Lebanon between the 1st and 5th centuries. The Evelyn tables are really special. A set of four anatomical preparations on wooden boards. These are the oldest anatomical preparations in Europe, and they get their name from the English writer John Evelyn, who acquired them in Padua in 1646 and donated them to the Royal Society. The tables, used as a teaching tool in Italy, each display a different system in the human body arteries, nerves, veins, that were dissected and then glued to pine planks and covered with varnish. It's really fiddly fine work. On this first table, we can see the spinal cord and nerves. On the second table, it's the aorta and the arteries. The third displays the vagus nerve and sympathetic nerves, as well as the veins of the lungs and liver. And the fourth panel shows vein distribution throughout the body. Now we're moving on to talk about surgery in the 1700s. This decidedly grisly drawing depicts, in a rather humorous way, the practice of postmortem dissection, which was finally becoming more accepted as a teaching method by the end of the 18th century. The formerly banned practice was finally sanctioned and became more common after Parliament introduced two schemes to hand over the body of executed criminals to anatomists, which included both barber surgeons and more professional surgeons, like Dr. Hunter, for dissection and learning purposes. Of course, these dissections were being performed on the dead, and the demand wasn't met by the number of executed criminals, so body snatching was still rife. To learn more about this practice, click on the link above and watch my video about the most macabre things in London's churches. Click on the section about the Body Snatcher Watch House at St. Sepulchre without Newgate. But what about surgery on the living? It wasn't actually all that different. Remember, surgery in the 1700s was a bloody and brutal affair. This was before the germ theory of medicine, so the vast majority of patients would die of infection after their procedures. The drawing we've been looking at is called The Reward of Cruelty, and it is by the famous Georgian social commentator William Hogarth. Just as an aside, there is a wonderful staircase painted by Hogarth just a short distance from here in the Barts Hospital Museum. Do note that this museum is closed for temporary repair and conservation work until 2025. Here, these specimens are a human hand and penis injected with dye to show the blood vessels, and they date to the late 18th century. There's also a human testicle and epididymis injected with mercury dating to the same period. In this cabinet, we see some lancets used for bloodletting. Of course, lancets were a vital part of kit for any barber surgeon, as they performed bloodletting on their clients. Monthly for everyone except women of menstruating age, who were bled just quarterly. We can also see some bone saws used for amputations in the era before anesthetic. Don't think about that too much. <laughs> Check out this elaborate jar, used for storing melrosarum, which was roses in honey, used for treating diseases of the mouth. After all the human specimens and the epididymis, melrosarum sounds pretty civilized. Elephant skulls like these gave rise to an ancient belief in the Cyclops. During the Pleistocene era, low sea levels allowed elephants and mammoths to make their way to the different land masses of the Mediterranean. Eventually, the inhabitants of ancient Greece discovered these elephant skulls, and seeing the gaping holes in the middle, they developed legends of the one-eyed cyclops. I mean, you can really see it. We're now heading into room two, dedicated to John Hunter's early years. In this case, we can see a set of peculiar little anatomy figurines carved out of ivory. These would have allowed patients to explain their symptoms to doctors without being examined, something that a physician in the 18th century would have been loath to do. After all, these were well-educated men who believed that touching their patients was often below their station in life. If you wanted more hands-on treatment, you should instead go to see a barber surgeon, and they're going to do things like let your blood, but they'll also pull your teeth 
squeeze your carbuncles and do other minor surgeries, as well as cutting your hair, something they still do today. Let's talk just a little more about the museum's founder and the museum's holdings, which are split into several different collections. The original collection was, of course, created by John Hunter, and it dates to the mid to late 1700s. Even from a young age, Hunter was fascinated by the natural world and the anatomy of humans and animals. He learned his trade by assisting his elder brother William with dissections at William's Anatomy School in central London, starting in 1748 when he was just 20 years old. He soon became an expert on the subject, surpassing his brother's knowledge and talent. Here is a portrait of William Hunter, John's brother, himself an esteemed anatomist. John Hunter was a prolific scientific mind, and he conducted regular experiments and observations on human and animal subjects, and built up an impressive collection of skeletons and organs prepared as anatomical specimens. When he died in 1793, he left behind a collection of more than 14,000 of these specimens, which were then used for surgical training in his museum and anatomy school, located first in Earl's Court and then in Leicester Square. His school was one of the first of its kind, giving young men with an interest in anatomy a legitimate place to learn and study surgery, which was still considered quite a ghoulish endeavour. After all, this was before the era of germ theory of medicine or pain relief, so most patients did sadly perish in agony. Those who didn't were certainly left with some nasty PTSD as they survived amputations without anesthesia. After Hunter's death, the British government recognized the importance of the collection and purchased the objects for £15,000 and entrusted their care to the Company of Surgeons, later known as the Royal College of Surgeons of England. Tragically, an incendiary bomb directly hit the Royal College of Surgeons building in May 1941, and around two-thirds of the museum's collections were destroyed. An unbelievable wealth of knowledge and heritage gone in an instant. The museum now holds only 3,000 original Hunterian specimens from the original 14,000. However, the museum has continued to collect objects since the 18th century, and it now boasts a large collection of surgical instruments, anatomical specimens, odontological specimens, that is, jaws and teeth, pathology specimens, and microscope slides. Together, they tell a comprehensive story about the past, present, and even the future of surgery and medicine. We can see some teeth here, which are a big part of the collection and a personal interest of Hunter's. He conducted experimental surgeries during which he attempted to transplant teeth from cadavers into living patients, and he even implanted an unformed tooth into the comb of a rooster. His rooster experiment was a success. Somehow the blood vessels of the comb grew into the pulp of the tooth, but it wasn't at all successful on human subjects. Here, we're about to walk into one of the most visually arresting parts of the museum, the Long Gallery, a long glass hall filled with wet specimens. In any medical museum, you need to be prepared to be unsettled and uncomfortable, and the Hunterian is no exception. This section is likely to make even the most steel-stomached visitor feel a bit uneasy, and even queasy, and it contains some ethically challenging specimens, including dozens of human fetuses and many, many human skulls. We'll talk about the ethics of displaying human remains a little bit later on, but for now let's get back to the museum's collection. It's important to remember that, as innovative and important as John Hunter's work was at the time, he was very much a product of the 18th century, and his ideas and theories about race were far from enlightened. His ideas about the perceived inferiority of certain races, for which he used skull shape and size to justify, would go on to influence medical and scientific theories for centuries to come. Hunter was an equal opportunity anatomist. He was equally fascinated by animal anatomy as he was by human anatomy. Here we can see one of his influential studies where he tracked the development of a goose in its egg. 
Many of these specimen preparations that track the development of different animals survived the bombing during World War II, and they therefore make up a large percentage of the surviving collection. However, that isn't necessarily an accurate reflection of his interest in the topic. He studied a lot of different things in the medical field. This particular preparation shows six different stages of the development of a gosling. It's especially interesting to note the presence of the egg tooth that helps break the shell when the gosling is ready to hatch. Of course, one absence at the newly reopened Hunterian is its former most famous inhabitant, Charles Byrne, also known as the Irish Giant. He is, however, still mentioned in this cabinet, and we can see his skeletal feet immortalized in the portrait of Hunter that greets us as we enter the museum. When the museum reopened in May, they elected to remove the skeleton from display. It had previously been on display since its acquisition for more than 200 years, and here is Queen Elizabeth II paying her respects. Charles Byrne lived with gigantism and grew to be 7 feet 6 inches tall before his death in 1783 at the young age of 22. After a life of being gawked at, he was terrified of being dissected by anatomists after his passing, so he paid two of his friends to lock his body in a wooden box and load it onto a ship near Margate in Kent so he could be buried at sea. However, Dr. Hunter was so keen to get his hands on this medical marvel that he paid the men 500 pounds, an astronomical sum in the day, to intercept the cadaver, and they broke their word to their deceased friend. For decades, campaigners have fought for Burns' skeleton to be released for burial in accordance with his documented wishes, removed from the eyes of the public and buried at sea. The museum has elected not to do this. In a statement, the museum acknowledged that anatomists and surgeons of the 18th and 19th centuries, quote, acquired many specimens in ways we would not consider ethical today, and which are rightly subject to review and discussion but they maintain that Byrne's skeleton is a, quote, integral part of the Hunterian collection, end quote, not to mention that it is covered by the museum's founding condition that the collection shall be kept in as perfect a state as possible. They have decided to keep the skeleton and make it available for further research on the pituitary adenoma that causes acromegaly and gigantism from excessive bone growth. Instead of Burns skeleton, which used to hold pride of place in the museum, it is instead replaced by a 1785 portrait of John Hunter by Joshua Reynolds. All of this brings up some very interesting questions about ethics and human remains in museums. After all, a lot of the specimens in the Hunterian are less than 250 years old, and they may even have living relatives who may be distressed by their presence. And Byrne is just one example. There are likely many other body parts here that belong to unwilling people who would not have wanted their remains on display, not to mention people whose corpses were stolen by body snatchers. And that brings us to the Human Tissue Act of 2004, which makes it possible to publicly display human remains that are more than 100 years old. This time limit is meant to mitigate the possibility that living relatives will be disturbed while balancing the value of displaying historic medical collections like the Hunterian and others in London on understanding the history and science of medicine. Remember, museums are not neutral places. In many cases, the rich were spared the potential indignity of being dissected and displayed to the public. This was almost exclusively the fate of the poor, the marginalized, and the criminal. The museum further states that it, quote, contains thousands of specimens of human remains gathered before modern standards of consent were established. We recognize the debt owed to these people, both named and unnamed, who in life and death have helped to advance medical knowledge, end quote. The ethics of displaying human remains is a complex and nuanced subject, covering surgical specimens like these, but also the remains of mummies, bog bodies, and even Neanderthal skeletons. So let me know in the comments below your thoughts and opinions on this very hot topic. Now let's take a few moments to move into Hunter's home and anatomy school when it was located at Earl's Court. You can see his continued interest in the natural world, including all of these specimens of animals and even plants and trees. This elephantiasis foot really caught my eye. It 
The bloated foot belonged to a sufferer with elephantiasis, which is the massive enlargement of one area of the body, usually a limb or the genitals. This one is particularly gruesome as we can see a cross section down to the bone, which isn't at all affected in this illness. Now keep in mind, I'm choosing to highlight the objects that I find most interesting, but there are thousands, tens of thousands of things that I'm not focusing on, so it's really worth a visit here yourself. Back into the long hall, and here we're going to have a look at Mr. Endersby's monkey. This may be a little less controversial than human remains, but it's no less unsettling. It's the full-term fetus of a rhesus monkey, poor little thing. This specimen belonged to a female monkey owned by Mr. Endersby, which is probably William Endersby of Bedfordshire. Dr. Hunter had a keen interest in observing pregnant animals, and a monkey was the perfect subject. He wrote a paper specifically about this monkey fetus, entitled Observations on Certain Parts of the Animal Economy, published in 1786. Sadly, this little monkey died during birth. The museum then takes us to Hunter's new premises after Earl's Court, his anatomy school in Leicester Square. We can see the trappings of a man who was now moving in high society, but still had the grisly possessions that fascinated him so dearly. Here we can see an epididymis of a boar, another epididymis, injected with mercury and mounted spirally in a circular glazed gilt frame, the perfect home decor for any society mover and shaker. Or how about this grim, wet specimen of, of a chimpanzee head from Sierra Leone? Or, of course, no 18th century anatomy collection is complete without a two-headed calf. In fact, I'm surprised this is the only one on display here. For many, many, many more of these, watch my video on the strangest museums in Paris and skip to the Musée Fragonard section. You can thank me or curse me later. This display refers to seasonal changes in testes. Hunter was endlessly interested in reproduction and genitals in general, I mean, who isn't? Which explains this series of wet specimens documenting the seasonal changes in the testes of house sparrows and how their genital size related to the temperature outside. I also really loved this little house diorama here. It includes this audio feature so you can hear what was happening in different parts of Hunter's Leicester Square residence. This is perfect for kids if they can handle the rest of the displays. These are the skulls of people afflicted with syphilis, a venereal disease that Hunter was very interested in studying. You can see that they are pitted from bone lesions and the nose structure is disintegrating. Syphilis causes the bones to demineralize, leaving them weak and prone to serious damage. The next skull in the case shows the damage caused by Paget's disease, which causes bones to grow larger and weaker than usual. The disease is named for Surgeon James Paget, who was the curator of the Hunterian Museum in the 1870s. Specimen 809 here features in a very famous book by another Hunter relative, John and William's nephew, Matthew Bailey. He wrote the influential pathology atlas Morbid Anatomy in 1799, which included a wealth of specimens from his uncle's collection. This is certainly an uncomfortable looking torso. This individual suffered from both kyphosis, where the spine twists front to back, and scoliosis, where the spine twists side to side. Having both is very rare, and it's called kyphoscoliosis. Some of the diseases we see here at the Hunterian are foreign to us in 21st century London. We have prophylactics to prevent them, or cures to treat them. However, here is an affliction that continues to affect so many to this day alcoholism. In John Hunter's 18th century London, alcohol was a scourge on the health of the rich and poor alike. The gin craze of the mid-1700s saw a huge rise in the consumption of the spirit across the country, something Hogarth, who we've already encountered on our tour, was particularly concerned about. By 1750, it's estimated that a quarter of all residences in St. Giles, just a stone's throw from here, were gin shops. Hogarth's most famous work, Gin Lane, illustrates the evils of drinking gin. 
you could see shocking scenes of depravity. In the foreground, a prostitute covered in syphilitic sores lets her baby slip from her arms in a gin-induced stupor, and it plunges to its certain death. Similarly, a man dances in the street holding a baby impaled on a spike, while the barber has taken his own life in the attic of his shop because no one can afford a shave or a haircut. It's hyperbolic satire, yes, but it illustrates the concerns that people had over Mother's Ruin. Funnily enough, this painting has a contrasting twin called Beer Street, which depicts happy, healthy residents and champions ale and beer as far healthier and more wholesome choices than gin. Here in this case, we can see a cirrhotic liver from someone who enjoyed the drink too much. John Hunter's treatise on venereal diseases is one of his most commonly cited studies, including the oft-repeated myth that he inoculated himself with gonorrhea and syphilis to prove his incorrect theory that they were the same underlying disease. However, the experiment, which is detailed in the treatise, does not reference self-experimentation. Instead, the experiment was most likely performed on a third party. Hunter advocated for the treatment of gonorrhea and syphilis with mercury and cauterization, yikes, and his impeccable reputation meant that his theory went unquestioned for a further 50 years until it was proved wrong by French physician Philippe Ricord. These delightful little oddities were part of a small museum that existed during Hunter's lifetime in his college at Leicester Square. Does seem kind of strange to call some of these delightful, but I digress. His college was later rebuilt and turned into the museum that we know today. The most disturbing is certainly this skull of a 25-year-old man with hydrocephalus, a buildup of fluid in the brain that usually affects small children. This is remarkable not only for the patient's age, but also the severity of the case and the way it has reshaped his skull. And now we're heading into room eight, called New Frontiers, which explores how the practice of surgery was transformed from the 18th century, when Hunter was alive and teaching, into the 19th century with three major breakthroughs, pain management, the germ theory of medicine, and the ability to identify diseases at a cellular level. Things become far more clinical than what we've seen in the museum thus far, with the appearance of familiar tools like microscopes. However, things do stay suitably macabre, especially with Joseph Town's wax models. Wax models were an important teaching tool, allowing students to visualize the body without the need for fresh cadavers and dissection. These medical waxes are the work of self-trained sculptor Joseph Town, a sculptor and moulageur who worked as the anatomical model maker for Guy's Hospital for 53 years in the 19th century. He attended dissections to learn about anatomy, but he refused to share his advanced sculpting methods, even blocking the keyhole of his lab so prying eyes couldn't spy on his methods. Here we see some of his wax models, including a human head and a chest and arm, showing the veins and circulatory system in graphic detail. Moulage is the French word for wax anatomical casts. To see many more of these, watch my video about the strangest museums in Paris and click on the Musée des Moulages. Speaking of waxes, here's a particularly evocative one. It's the wax model of a man's head, with the left cheek open to show two disembodied hands excising a mandibular tumor caused by phosphorus necrosis, more commonly called fossy jaw. This man was likely very poor, working a dangerous job that is actually more commonly associated with young female workers called matchstick girls. Matchstick makers were exposed to phosphorus vapors, which would cause painful gum and toothaches. The damage progressed quickly, and within a few months, their jawbones would begin to disintegrate and rot, with the flesh necrotizing and the ailments spreading to the brain. The so-called matchstick girls and women are deeply connected to labor rights in this country. In 1888, the workers at the Bryant and May Matchstick Company in Bow successfully organized and went on strike for safer working conditions and better pay. Following the strike's success, they formed the Union of Women Matchmakers, later the Matchmakers Union, and inspired a wave of collective organizing amongst industrial workers. Okay, 
Now here's a really creepy object, a dental phantom. Even the name is creepy. This is a traditional head that dentists use to practice their craft. Of course, the dental profession got its start in a rather grisly way, with barbers pulling teeth and sometimes even selling them on to wealthy benefactors to make dentures. In addition to the red and white striped barber's pole representing clean and bloody bandages used for bloodletting, you could sometimes see strings of teeth hanging in barber shop windows. This dental phantom is certainly creepy, a fitting tribute to the macabre origin of this profession. Room 9 brings us into the present as it explores scientific advances from 1914 to 2023. Next to this depiction of open heart surgery, we have a shocking specimen that shows the damage caused by prolonged exposure to x-rays. This hand belonged to an x-ray technician in the 1920s. And this display, as well as the rest of this room, really shows us that we have come such a long way in just a few hundred years. This cabinet showcases some of the early plastic surgery pioneered by Dr. Harold Gillies. His life and innovative techniques are chronicled in a fantastic book, which happens to be available in the gift shop called The Face Maker by Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris. Now, I'm an amateur medical historian, but she's the real deal. And her other book, The Butchering Art, is also a must read. Gillies treated the tragically wounded soldiers returning from World War I. These were a whole new class of wound, the likes of which had never been seen or treated, caused by shrapnel and powerful rifle fire, not to mention near-fatal burns. Gillies pioneered skin grafting and facial reconstruction techniques to help mend their faces and give them back a sense of self and independence. And finally, our last piece, here in room 10, which is called Transforming Lives, is called Jennifer's Heart. This room is all about the personal experiences of surgery, which can be life-changing for both patients and surgeons. A short video plays in the room, featuring an interview with Jennifer Sutton, who underwent a heart transplant in 2007, and Stephen Large, a heart and lung surgeon at Royal Papworth Hospital. They detail their experiences of Jennifer's transplant and stress the importance and generosity of organ donors and their families. In what has to be the museum's most touching display, Jennifer's native heart, that is the heart she was born with, is presented in a clear box. Jennifer says, I'm glad it's in that jar and I have a new one. I am grateful though, as it kept me alive for 22 years. It's like an old friend. That's a sobering and contemplative way for us to end our tour of the fascinating and yes, grisly Hunterian Museum in London. Well, that's it for me today here at the Hunterian Museum. I hope that you learned a little bit about the history of surgery, that you enjoyed the tour, and that you're inspired to come and visit yourself. And I'll see you the next time I'm at the museum. <laughs>